And all of you are looking at me going like, of course. Hello and welcome ladies. Welcome back if you're one of my wonderful subscribers. And hello and welcome if you are new here. My name is Jordan, also known as Jax, and this is my channel where I share with you my story to building a family. I thought I'd take a moment to sit down and kind of recap what has happened in the last two years since a few days ago was the two year like anniversary of us starting infertility treatments. And honestly, I had almost forgotten all of the stuff that we had gone through and tried. So I wanted to get everybody kind of up to speed. And if you're new to this channel, this is a great place to start because I'm gonna go from start to finish what's happened on in our infertility journey so far. So go ahead, grab your hot chocolate, grab your coffee, and sit down and get ready to go on this roller coaster of a journey with me. Mm. So even though we started fertility treatments two years ago, I do need to take just one more step back uh, to give you the full story. I promise it won't take too, too long. And if you just came off of my one year update and that's what you're watching and now it's suggesting this, then go ahead and skip to this time to go ahead and skip to just year two where I left off. In May of 2016, the husband and I got married. And the day before our wedding, I got my last Depo Puvera shot. I knew that I didn't want to have to worry about birth control. <laughs> it sounds silly now, worry about birth control. I knew I didn't want to worry about birth control while I was on the honeymoon. I knew that it took six to 12 months for Depo to wear off. So I wanted to make sure that when we were ready to have kids, ready to have kids. This is hilarious retelling this, by the way. When we were ready to have kids, I wanted the depot shot to be completely out of my system, right? I didn't, I didn't want that to be a hindrance. I got my last depot shot and in May, and then it wasn't until January I got a cycle, and it was a doozy of a cycle. It lasted 25 days, not my cycle, my period. So that was too many days, turns out. And I got an appointment with my OBGYN and she agreed that was too many days. And she also asked me a bunch of questions that led her to believe that I had PCOS. And she ordered a bunch of blood work and ultrasounds. And it turns out she was right. Thus began our infertility journey starting in February of 2017 with metformin very commonly prescribed for women with PCOS. It was not right for me. I didn't know any better at the time. Lesson learned. I have a whole playlist of PCOS videos now that I know better. I am a researcher, so I try to share as much of my knowledge on my channel as I can. If there's nothing wrong with your blood sugar, you don't need to be on metformin. Go ahead, go skill up on PCOS so you can have a more informed talk with your doctor than I did. After three or so months of metformin, which is incredibly grueling on your system, I had not gotten another cycle. In June of 2017, my OBGYN suggested a progesterone challenge, which is just the process of taking progesterone, which obviously raises your progesterone, letting it fall, and seeing if your body will naturally respond to that trigger because that is what happens during a natural cycle. Your progesterone is up, you're not pregnant, so it falls back down and you start your period. She suggested we do a progesterone challenge and see if a cycle would just pick up naturally and my body just needed a little jump start. It did not work. In July then, we did a progesterone challenge with Famara and did a blood draw after I had taken Famara. Then after so many days after taking Famara, they draw your LH to see if you have ovulated. I had not. She suggested that I could continue doing cycles with her or I could go see an RE. And at this point I was educated enough and I was just like, no, done with this nonsense. You've been watching me for a while. You know that I believe you should not do any fertility treatments with your OBGYN if it all it can be helped. I just, they are not there to make babies. They are there to deal with your uterus pre-baby. They are dealing with your uterus when it has a baby in it. They do not deal with that intermediary stay, step of getting a baby in there. Like that is not their job. That is why there's reproductive endocrinologists. Please just go to our RE as soon as you know you need fertility treatments. PSA over. In October 
of 2017, I had my first appointment with my RE, and I really liked her. I mentioned that because if you don't like your RE, if you don't jive with them, pick a new one, go get another consult. You're gonna be spending a lot of money and time with them and pain and emotions. So go ahead and make sure you like them to start with and don't feel bad if you have to switch at the beginning or in between cycles. Most women end up with more than one RE at some point. My RE ordered a litany of tests. All the tests back came back relatively normal, confirmed my PCOS diagnosis, confirmed I don't have any genetic markers or predispositions, and she said that we should try a monitored medical cycle with oral medications, very similar to what I did with my OBGYN, but this time she was gonna up my dose of Femara to the maximum dose. The monitored portion of monitored medical cycles is that you go in for ultrasounds to check on your follicle growth. I came in for my follicle scan and there was nothing to happen in. So we converted that cycle to a hybrid cycle literally a few days before Christmas. Luckily though, that did the trick. I responded very well to Gonal F. So this cycle had consisted of progesterone, Femara, and Gonal F, and a trigger shot. Triggered ovulated on January 1st of 2018 and we got pregnant off that cycle. Oh God, it's so hard to look, I don't want to. Went in for betas really early because I was testing out my trigger shot and they doubled and tripled just like they were supposed to. Scheduled my first ultrasound, I think at six and a half weeks. And that's when we got our first bit of kind of telling news. Uh, the baby was measuring behind by a few days and the heart rate was rather low. It was very early though. They tell you that that can mean that maybe the heartbeat just started. They said, come back in a week. We came back in a week. And on the one year anniversary of me starting my fertility treatments, I was told that this wasn't going to be a viable pregnancy. But the extra bad part of that was that the heartbeat hadn't stopped all the way, which meant I needed to come in in another week to see if the heartbeat had stopped all the way so that we could schedule my DNC. I think that is one of the particularly cruelest moments in this journey. There's gonna be a few others, but that was particularly cruel, knowing that my baby was dying and knowing that I was gonna get a DNC because I wanted the genetic results but just having to wait and keep going to appointments and keep like functioning, ugh, that was awful. Late February, I had my DNC. I went on a vacation in March and... March. And when we got back from that vacation, we jumped right back on the horse and started another hybrid injectable cycle. Guys, it's the last shot of the cycle. Get excited. One more shot. Over the summer of 2018, we did two more of those cycles. I'm trying to think. We did two more of those cycles I had to find a new role or a new job because my position was being moved to a different org within my company, which was stressful. My mother had cancer removed, which was very stressful. We went on vacation in June, which was not stressful, but it did stop us from doing our fourth cycle back to back. Oh, you are recording. Well, hello everybody. We're about to see some lovely monuments, both in the light and in the dark. Mostly That's today's dark. trip. Mostly the dark. <laughs> Good job, Austin. Thank you for doing my job for me. I appreciate it. Thumbs up, thumbs up for this video. My plan for 2018 had been to just back to back to back cycles 
until we got to cycle number six, because that's when I was gonna call it quits if it didn't work again. Came back from the vacation, called Dari, e, said I wanted to start another cycle. She said, take a pregnancy test. I did, it was negative. And then I started the progesterone, which is the first medication in my hybrid cycle protocol. A few, like a week into my progesterone, I was feeling weird. I was feeling weird and I can remember standing in the bathroom with the husband and I was just like, my boobs hurt. And I was like, ah, oh, that's weird. Like the only time my boobs hurt are when, like the only, I, they just don't. The only other time that I can remember them ever hurting was when I was pregnant the first time. So I've been on this journey for a while. I have a zillion pregnancy tests in the house. You have the little cheapy ones, it's 25 cents. I call it 25 cents for sanity for the day. And I'm more than happy to pay the toll to not think throughout the day, oh, I might be pregnant. So I'm one of those, some people on this journey like ban themselves from pregnancy tests because they don't like seeing the negative over and over and over again. I'm kind of on the other spectrum. I'm like, if it gives me peace of mind for the day, 25 cents. Way worth it for me to not be like, Oh, that was a weird twinge over here. I wonder if I have like, no, 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 I pay the toll. So I didn't even think about it at this point. I've taken literally hundreds of these cheapy tests. I took the cheapy test. I put it on the counter, turned on the shower and went about my morning routine, came back, looked at it. And it was, I didn't even have to like pick it up to see it was positive. Honestly, didn't know what to do. I ran upstairs because the husband was working out, pulled him off the treadmill and I was like, oh my gosh, look at this, look at this, look at this. He didn't know what he was looking at. I was like, it's a pregnancy test. And he's like, eh? I couldn't believe it. And so I sat down and you can watch this video, sat down and, and took a real, you know, test that says pregnant or not. And I just really couldn't believe it. I don't know how to do this one. It's just if there's lines. There is. What had happened is the stimulation drugs, the gonalef, the injectable drugs, they stay in your system long after that cycle. Didn't know that until this occurred. I had had a pseudo normal cycle. It was still very long. It would have been like 45 day long cycle, but I had ovulated with the help of these drugs. Like it, it, they had boosted my my follicles up enough so that they could actually be ovulated. And because I had done those two previous cycles back to back, my body was kind of sort of competent enough to follow through on this cycle. And then I got pregnant. So it wasn't natural by, by any means, but it was assisted. It was an assisted cycle. The next hours were spent feverishly going through my logs on my app, my like my period tracking app. So my app lets you track all of the signs of ovulation as well as just like your period. There had been a cluster of days back in June where I had sworn I was ovulating. I didn't take a test, totally kicked myself for it later. I didn't take a test because we were on a break, a break, like we were on vacation. And I was like, we're not gonna think about infertility for a month, little mental break should have trusted myself, whatever. At least I had enough data to figure out when I'd ovulated. Called my clinic, said I need an ultrasound. We scheduled it for much later than our first ultrasound to avoid the same drama as last time. I say drama, trauma would be an equally appropriate word. And my clinic was very open to that. They totally understood that we're not doing six and a half week ultrasound. We're gonna wait till you're into your seventh week. Really appreciate that when the nurses know that you're monitoring everything so you know what's going on with your body. In the meantime, I did come in for betas and this is all documented by the by. You can watch this. Went in for my betas and they were so low. They were so low and I went into that seven week ultrasound ready. Just ready for bad news. And then it wasn't bad news. It was a perfectly healthy looking seven week nugget. That's what the, the ultrasound tech kept calling it, a nugget. It was perfectly fine. It was measuring perfectly. The heart rate was perfect. And 
I, a whole weight was just lifted from me at that moment. I graduated from my fertility clinic, I got an appointment with my normal OBGYN for 10 weeks, and I waited out those weeks, and it was so weird not to have to go in for blood draws or ultrasounds. Three whole weeks, they left me alone, and it was bizarre. <laughs> Went in for what I thought was gonna be an ultrasound at my OBGYN, so I had told the husband to come along. Turned out it wasn't an ultrasound, I had misunderstood, and it was just a, um, like a Doppler scan to hear the heartbeat. That's what I misunderstood. The OBGYN had said, we're gonna hear the heartbeat, and I'd interpreted it as see, whatever, it's fine. And it was very lucky, because then the husband came, even though most of the time your partner wouldn't come to that ultrasound, I guess. Not ultrasound, appointment. But he was there, and thankfully so, because she laid me back on the table, she got out the Doppler, and searched for a heartbeat, and I couldn't find one. Each moment that ticked by, I just was more and more sure of what had happened. She said, maybe you have a tilted uterus. I don't. Maybe I'm, you know, it's just in a weird position. We'll get you in, you're gonna get the ultrasound you wanted. And they left us alone in the room because there was already a lady in their only sonogram room. They kicked her out and had me come in, the ultrasound tech probed around for a while, and then said that she had to step out of the room for a minute. Which for the record, is a cruddy thing to do to someone. Like, I'm not gonna tell you what happened. It was just a very weird interaction and a complete nightmare scenario, obviously. Incredibly thankful that the husband was there. They shuffled us back to the other room, my OBGYN told us that this pregnancy was at an end and had probably stopped about two weeks ago, which jived right with when my morning sickness had stopped, like very abruptly, very abruptly, my all my symptoms had stopped and I'd been having pretty bad morning sickness. I'd been losing about a pound a week because I just could not eat. I wanted to believe that it was okay because I was at 10 weeks and all of the boards and books will tell you that at 10 weeks, yeah, your morning sickness can wane off, but mine stopped abruptly. Little did I know, it was because that pregnancy was ending. Oh, I'm mistaken. This appointment was actually a 12 week appointment. It occurred on the due date of our first pregnancy. So I went in on the due date of my first pregnancy for my 12 week appointment and found out the pregnancy wasn't viable. That was another really low moment. Because of all the days it could have been, it was that one. Could have been such the opposite. It could have been a day of redemption and clearing the slate of the sadness around this date. It could have turned that day of sadness into something great. And instead, the world kind of doubled down. She said she could get us scheduled for a DNC. That happened two days later, which I was very grateful that happened in a much quicker time frame. It was very helpful. The husband stayed home with me for the next few days just to make sure I was okay. A few days after the DNC, after I'd recovered physically a bit, it took me about a month to physically fully recover from the DNC, which was way longer than my previous DNC, which only took a like two weeks, which irked me, of course. You don't want to be reminded every day of that. A few days after my DNC, I made a list of things I wanted to accomplish in the remainder of the year. I was the rem my 2018 goals around fertility and everything that involves, which is your career and your relationships and your insurance and your finances. Infertility just affects all of those areas so much. So I made a list of, I believe, the 15 things for 2018. I believe I completed 14 and a half of the things on that list. The only thing I didn't complete fully was getting my tattoos scheduled. I found my artist and I know the concept I wanna go with, but I didn't get that scheduled because nice tattoos cost a lot of money and we went into a high savings mode because we decided to start the adoption process. 
if you want to know the full cost of adoption, I have a video for that too. One of the things on my list was to find an adoption agency and start the home study process. In December of 2018, we started our adoption home study process and obviously chose an agency as well. We also got insurance lined up and our fertility clinic on board to start an IVF cycle. Because I'm an insane person, I decided to do my home study adoption process and my IVF at the same time. Don't recommend. <laughs> it was very stressful. And all of you are looking at me going like, of course. On January 8th, I went in for my egg retrieval. I retrieved 33 eggs. There's plenty of videos if you wanna go watch the drama that ensued, but we ended up with three healthy PGS normal embryos on ice now, waiting for us. I'm very excited about that. It did validate me in the fact that I switched from hybrid cycles to IVF after those miscarriages. I believe truly that those miscarriages and that high uh, degradation of embryos is because of some underlying issue. This year, I am gonna pursue probably getting a sperm DNA fragmentation test just to get some answers and close the loop on that whole process. December and January were spent completing the home study process. Uh, as of February 1st, we have our home study complete. We only need one more meeting before we can go live with our adoption agency. And if you follow me on Instagram, blah, 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 then you can get the latest and greatest on that. We do plan to go live sometime in February or early March for our adoption agency and save our embryos until probably 2020. We chose an agency that works with a very small amount of families so the wait times usually aren't that bad. And they also provide a lot of care to birth mothers, which was very important to me. We are also potentially working with a private situation. I haven't mentioned that before because it is honestly just not very likely to work out. Uh, the birth father isn't on board as far as we can tell. Communication shaky it is definitely something we are pursuing, but it is, like I said, just not very, certain the adoption agency is obviously a much more concrete option. The only reason we're spending our time and energy with the private option is because it is way cheaper, like way cheaper. <laughs> it's way cheaper and there are personal connections with the potential birth mother, which would be in our eyes a very positive uh, having those connections with that child. That potential birth mother is due in March, so we should know within the next month whether or not that works out. That being said, I do have a nursery ready just in case that works out and a nursery tour video will be going up soon. The plan for the rest of 28 or 2019 is to get go live with our adoption agency and hopefully get placed with a child. That is our 2019 hope and goal and I don't see a reason why it shouldn't happen. And of course, I'm gonna keep making videos. If there's anything in particular you want to see or questions you have, leave them down below. Thank you, thank you once again for following me. It has been wonderful to have you ladies on this journey with me. And until next time, ladies, keep on fighting!